Net zero. Net zero. Zero emission. First of all, nobody knows what will be the consequence of more CO2 into the atmosphere. The science of atmosphere is extremely complex. What if I told you that hydrogen had already been an option studied for a long time after the oil crisis of the 70s? Some people will remember it, but the newer generation may not. Following the crisis, which created oil shortage, many scientists and experts were looking for an alternative energy source. One of the options was hydrogen. Even liquefaction for transportation was considered. The result was that hydrogen was abandoned as a potential source to replace fossil fuel. One of the experts to have work on the file is Samuel Lee for Ferry. He was a senior official at the European Commission where he worked for 36 years in the Directorate General for Energy, wrote several articles and books on energy, including hydrogen. Professor Samueli Forfari, now retired, was also a chemical engineer at the Université Libre de Bruxelles in Belgium, where he obtained his PhD in 1982 and was president of the European Society of Engineers and Industrialists. Today, he grants us an interview to explain what he knows about hydrogen and what he thinks of this green push by government on hydrogen. Let's check it out. During my time in the Commission, I was in charge of sustainable development, uh, including climate change. And therefore, I uh, learned a lot of things from the inside, and I published book on sustainable development, on energy policy, and because I'm teaching about uh, energy geopolitics, I wrote books on uh, energy geopolitics, because it's essential when you talk about energy to understand the system, because if you look on small corn of the energy politics, uh, you will be misled. You need to look at the global world situation to understand and to find solution, uh, because energy is a system. Is not just a local one. Because of my age, during my uh, studies, uh, there was a oil crisis, very deep and difficult situation, 1973s, and uh, even deeper in 1979. And uh, we were confronted with a difficulty of uh, supply of energy. We didn't have energy. Today we have a lot of energy, but very expensive. The problem is the price. It's not the the availability uh, during the crisis in the 70s, it was availability. We didn't have energy. And so we start to work seriously to find solutions. And it's at that moment that I joined the European Union to co collaborate with those, uh, uh, with the colleagues to find solutions. And we have to admit that uh, there is not a lot of solution. Even after two terrible crises in the 70s, even after more than 40 years, fossil fuel is still the deep reality in the world. 85% in the world, 75% in the European Union. And in Canada, it's more or less the same. We have tried hard, we spent billions to find other solutions, and we have not been able to find it. And particularly for hydrogen, don't believe that we discover the, the policy of hydrogen nowadays. When I joined the commission, it was already 20 years that the European colleagues in the Commission were working on hydrogen production. It was not new. It started back in 1959 with Mr. Cesare Marchetti. He invented this policy to try to develop hydrogen as an energy. Today, we are still at the same point. Why? Because physics and chemistry decide what we are going to do with hydrogen, not politician. It's a question of chemistry and physics, or let's say thermodynamic. And uh, when we you look at the number, you realize that hydrogen cannot be a solution for energy. Hydrogen is precious. It's fantastic. Hydrogen is the basic of the chemical industry. 
and we will continue to produce hydrogen. For the time being, we, we produce 130 million ton of hydrogen because we need it for the chemical industry. But it, it's a nonsense to burn such a precious molecule to produce heat when you can produce heat with other type of energy. It's why uh, this new uh, uh, mantra of hydrogen uh, will, will finish as the before, as the previous one without uh, any success. So they want to take the hydrogen, the green hydrogen in, in Canada and ship it to Germany. They want to transfer it on ammonium and retransform the ammonium on hydrogen. Is it realistic? This is nothing new. In the 80s, the province of Quebec signed an agreement with the DG Energy of the European Commission to produce hydrogen in Quebec, because Quebec has a lot of hydroelectricity, that means a lot of electricity, and to transport this hydrogen to Europe to burn it in cars and train and ships and airplanes. And then they re they being confronted to the reality. Hydrogen is a gas. To transport it, you need to transform it into liquid. At that time, they work on toluene and methyl cyclohexane, excuse me for the chemical terms, but they work seriously to find solutions. And it was far too expensive for energy. Today, they come back with the same solution with a small difference. Instead of using toluene, they talk about uh, ammoniac, but it's the same problem. It's a nonsense from a macroeconomic point of view. You can do that for sure, no problem, but it's a nonsense from the economic point of view. Furthermore, ammoniac is a very dangerous product, very dangerous uh, product for health. And therefore, uh, believing that you are going to create a market between Canada and Germany with this product is a nightmare. And further on, there is no market for hydrogen. Who is going to buy the hydrogen? There is no car, no pump, no, no boiler. There is no market. You need to create everything. It's why this is really surprising that first top country in the world, like Germany, go to Canada to negotiate something which is not existing. Hydrogen is not existing. Use of hydrogen is not existing and will not exist. It's very surprising. Why they are pushing that energy source? Uh, because they are uh, in a cul de sac, as we say in French. They have promised, particularly in Germany, with the energy vendor, that they will abandon, first of all, nuclear energy. Don't forget, the main target of energy transition is nuclear energy. Fossil fuel come after. They have promised to abandon nuclear energy and to find new solution. They are trying desperately to find new solution. It's why they talk about energy vendor, which is meaning energy transition. But we, we have discovered the energy transition uh, uh, issue in uh, nearly 50 years ago, and we didn't find it. So Germany are, are, are not clever than 50 years of research in the European Commission, which have not been able to find a solution. What would be our repercussion on our country if we continue to follow that path? You will lose money and time. Just that. Money and time. Energy is a serious thing. It's not dreams. We do not have the right to dream on energy because population need abundant and cheap energy. We do not use energy as a holidays or cinema. Energy is a need for our daily life, for the citizen, especially in the cold country like Canada or Germany, but for the industry. So it's a serious question. We need to provide cheap and abundant energy to the citizen and to industry, and stop dreaming about hydrogen and other renewable uh, solutions. We have not been able to do that. Since 19, 1973, with spending billions of euro or dollars to promote renewable energy, wind and solar represent today in Europe, and it's more or less the same in the world and in Canada, 
three percent. So uh, we should remain on the ground and believe that tomorrow we will continue to use fossil fuel and nuclear. Canada have a, a big advantage on the other country. Canada is a major OECD country with a lot of energy. In Canada, you have a lot of uranium, which is necessary to produce uh, nuclear energy. You have a lot of coal. You have a lot of gas. You have a lot of oil in Athabasca, for example. But also a lot of hydro in Quebec. So you, you should be privileged in this world. Canada is a privileged country. Use all the, the benefits of the nature that give you to help the rest of the world. You don't need to dream about oxygen. You have everything. Canada and uh, Australia will be the savior of OECD in energy policy, provided you stop to dream about uh, hypotheses which are uh, totally unsound. So for now, what is the only possibility that is open to us? To be realistic and to follow China, India, Russia, and the rest of the world to use fossil fuel and nuclear energy. It's only the G7 countries which are misleading their population with renewable and hydrogen. The rest of the world is not falling, falling in the trip, in the pit, sorry. They know that they are, have to rely on fossil fuel and nuclear energy. If you look at the development of nuclear energy in the world, it's impressive. China, Russia, Korea, even Argentina, even Denmark. Even Denmark is developing new technologies on nuclear energy because we will need nuclear energy in the future. And of course, everybody is relying on oil, gas, and coal. Don't forget the coal. Coal is a major fuel in the world. 45% of the electricity produced in the world is coming from coal. And this will not disappear because it's a cheap energy. Africa, Asia, of course, Russia, will continue to burn coal. Why should we say them, well, you should not do that because we, you want to reduce the CO2 emissions? Well, nobody cares about the CO2 reduction about the G7. Because they say that it's actually really, really bad for the planet and we need to, to decrease our utilization and we need to almost like reach a net zero, the famous net zero that we heard like all the time. Net zero. Net zero. Zero emissions. First of all, nobody knows what will be the consequence of more CO2 in the atmosphere. The science of atmosphere is extremely complex. The report of IPCC are very balanced, full of hypotheses, full of conditions, full of error calculus, which are totally different of the executive report which is given to the population. What is given to the population is not a scientific report. It's a political report created by officials of the administration. I take part of that. So I can tell you that the report that the people are told are political report. The real scientific report, thousands, thousands of pages, is totally different. And it's full of uncertainties. So we doesn't know what will be the consequence of more CO2 into the atmosphere. First thing. Second thing, we don't know if this will be bad because there are also good uh, consequences of more CO2, starting from better quality of life of population and also greening of the planet. Third thing, we do not see the reduction of CO2 emission despite the Convention of the United Nations of 1992. It's since 1992 that we say that we should reduce, and in this we have increased by 58%. The word since the moment we say that we should reduce have increased by 58% the emissions. And last thing, we are clever enough to cope with difficulties. We are much more able to deal with difficulties than the previous generation. We are rich. So we are able to cope with difficulties. 
So all those conditions give me the to be optimistic about uh, CO2 emissions. I'm not afraid of climate change. We are clever. We are extremely powerful. And so we can find solution if there is a threat. Uh, government and elites are pushing for the 2050 net zero emission. Why, first of all, do you think they are pushing on this direction? And is it really realistic? First of all, when you say government, we should say G7 government. I'm not seeing uh, India, Argentina. I'm not seeing uh, uh, Egypt. Uh, I'm not seeing Nigeria, Russia, uh, Kuwait, uh, China dealing with this net zero. It's a mantra of the G7. And this is why it's dangerous. Because the rest of the world do not care about net zero. And therefore, they take the, all the advantage of fossil fuel, and we are destroying our economy. Why we are so blind? Well, this is another question. I do not have the, the answer, or it will be too uh, speculative. But clearly, we are wrong. G7 is totally wrong in believing that the rest of the world is following that. I repeat, since Rio 1992, we have increased globally CO2 emission by 58%. We are very far away from any tendency to go toward net zero. Only G7 can promise this type of uh, thing. I am retired since four years uh, from the European Commission. I have refused to be a lobbyist, a consultant, because I believe that it's my duty as a former a uh, public servant to explain what is the situation in the field that I know because I work in this sector. I think that most of the people who are talking about energy are biased, just biased, because they need to defend their companies, their policies, and therefore they use the same mantra in order to, to get the financing for what they are doing. There is too much money involved in energy. Energy is a sector with a lot of money. And therefore, it's always possible to, to manipulate to have some advantages. That's one of the problems of the energy policy. It's a huge sector with a lot of money. So as you know, at Ruben News, we want to expose the new green reset that the government want to impose on us. So we started the petition at nogreenreset.com. And as well, if you want, sign the petition and chip in generously so we can expose the other side of the story of what is going on with this new push into the government.